On we go. Can't complain. We get another white and we get a strong opponent. Parthi Chess from India and another Sicilian. Awesome. So this is an Alapin day. And this will probably be a separate YouTube video. So people watching on YouTube, uh, I'm recording this right after playing the previous Alapin game, which was its own video. Uh, that was the 20 move win where we won the queen at the end. It's the same night. Hopefully we get another convincing win. All right. Once again, we face D5. Once again, we face d5, and this time we face the line that I recommended for black. So this is actually kind of cool. This is the line that I recommend to most people against the Alapin for several reasons. I think objectively, it's quite good. White can obtain a slight advantage if he knows a load of theory. I will admit I'm pretty rusty on the theory here myself. But even if white plays all the correct moves, you get a pretty enterprising and unbalanced position. So in terms of playing against the Alapin for a win, knight f6 is really second to none. And most people who play the Alapin don't really study this line. It falls through the cracks. And black can definitely get an advantage if white doesn't handle this accurately. So the point of knight f6, of course, is to recapture with the knight, which is a more convenient way to recapture the pawn. The downside may appear to be that white has c4. But as you already hopefully have picked up from multiple speedrun games, c4 is not a solution to white's problems because black responds with e6. And in the event of the trade, black gets total monopoly over the key central squares and full compensation for the pawn. And I'll explain that, reiterate that after the game. We will check the Alep and Bible after this game because I will fully confess that I am blanking on what their recommended line is it might be a check on a4 i think it is a check on a4 but that's not what we're gonna play here i do know a very practical line i've played it in blitz and although black can equalize with very accurate play it does pose a lot of problems at least initially and we will test our opponent's knowledge of this line the move that we're gonna start with is bishop to b5 check which should be on your radar as a very natural move because it forces a piece to land on d7. And as a consequence of that, the contact between the queen and the d5 pawn has been severed. Black plays knight bd7, which is the correct move, which is the correct move. And now, now that the knight is occupying an awkward square and the black bishop will have a hard time getting out, this is when we choose to open up the center. So this is where, rather than trying to cling to this pawn with the move c4, which is a very theoretical line, Black responds with a6 and then a quick b5. Very dangerous for white. And rather than trying something like queen f3, to which black can again respond with a6, and ultimately the knight will jump out to e5, it'll have the opposite effect. Now is the time when we strike with d4. Now we strike with d4. So we open up the center. Obviously, if black plays knight takes d5, then we can capture the pawn on c5. The pawn cannot be recaptured because the knight is pinned. And the knight on d5 is suddenly going to be hanging. dc is a discovered attack. If black plays c takes d4, then we can recapture with the queen. Our queen is almost shielded by the pawn on d5, which acts kind of like an umbrella. So the queen on d4 is not going to be easy to attack. And unless black is very, very precise here, it's easy to end up a pawn down for no compensation. I don't even fully remember how black is supposed to play this, which is kind of a good thing. A6 here might be the best move. We'll check all of this with the engine and with the book after the game. So hold all of your opening thoughts. This is definitely a, a gap that we, that we need to fill from both sides. Yeah, because if you kind of just visually look at the position after CD, queen, D4, it looks bad for black, right? It doesn't look like black is anywhere near recovering the pawn on d5. And once we do that, then c4 becomes a lot uh, more palatable of a possibility. Because once the center is opened, the move c4 does not contain any downsides. Whereas playing it here with the pawn still sitting on d2, that's where the problems come from. Because after c4, e6, and the trade, that pawn becomes a backward pawn. And that correspondingly, the square on d4 is a big outpost that black can use for their knight. Okay, so black continues to ponder his next move. Woodwood asks, after knight takes d5, dc, e6, 
Does white play b4? I wouldn't play b4. I think there, there was c6 in that position, but we'll explore that after the game. Our opponent has played a6, which I'm 99% sure is in fact the correct move. Now, bishop a4 would be too stubborn and counterproductive because it would merely enable black to expand on the queen side with b5. More importantly, it would give black the fianchetto square for free for the light squared bishop. So definitely not bishop a4. Definitely not bishop c4. Again, the point is not to cling to the extra pawn. It's to use the pawn as a bargaining chip and gain a lead in development in return for that pawn, which is currently an extra pawn. So by recapturing it, black simply equalizes the material. So we make a modest move. We make a modest move. Those of you who've seen all of the speedrun videos might remember that you have a similar kind of idea, which I recommended against. I think it's called the Portuguese variation of the Scandinavian where you throw in the check on b5 and then drop the bishop all the way back to e2. Why not d3? Because again, that destroys the connection between the queen and the pawn. Bishop d3, black can capture on d4, and what we do not want is an isolated queen pawn position where black's knight is already blockading the square in front of it. Instead, we drop back to e2, and we simply continue developing our pieces. I think against Narayanan, I played this in a rapid blitz game, I think I might have tried an early c4 and d5. And I did manage to get a good position in that game. So let me think for a second. What do we want to do here? Of course, the, the sort of natural move is knight f3. But I, do, I really do like the look of c4 here. Driving the pawn down to d5. Kind of Benoni style. Um, there, 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 there. I know there's a lot of theory in that position. Let's try c4. Let's try to be as principled as possible because we will not get another chance to play c4 and d5. Why not? Because if black's pawn had already been on e6 here, then the move d5 would be completely counterproductive because after the trade, our pawn on d5 would be a sitting duck and black would pick it off with the knights and the queen. Now, of course, if black plays e6, we invite that because we take on e6 and we ruin black structure. I think white is a little bit better here. Okay, g6. So our opponent is playing this kind of like a Benoni. We need to develop our pieces, right? We've made enough pawn moves to last us a lifetime. I don't think it even matters what move we start with. Knight c3, knight f3. Not of principal importance. Let's start with knight c3. Now let's bring the other knight out to f3. And let's get our king out of the center. Presumably our opponent will do the same. And I think black's position is pretty unpleasant here. Now we could also throw in the move h3 which would be a typical move that you often see in these types of positions, just covering the g4 square. But I'm not concerned about knight g4, so I think it's more important for us to develop. Also, uh, meriting attention was the move a4. If you're familiar with uh, the Benoni, you probably know that b7, b5 is one of black's main sources of queenside counterplay. Um, and here as well, black could contemplate the move b5. It's a very advanced move. Because here it involves a pawn sacrifice, kind of Benko Gambit style. And I'm not convinced that it's sound in this position. But, you know, a Soviet schoolboy might have played a4 just to cardinally prevent the possibility of b5. Of course, a4 has certain positional downsides. It weakens the b4 square. But that square is not going to be easy to occupy. There is neither of Black's knights will be able to easily make their way to b4. Yeah, so black is worse, I think, because we've got a space advantage. We've got a nice pawn wedge in, in the center. We've got clear subsequent development for our pieces, right? Bishop can come out to g5 or maybe e3 in order to pressure the pawn. Then we can play queen d2, and our opponent does indeed play b5. Okay, I'm pretty impressed that, you know, that, that, that he was able to come up with this idea because it takes a knowledge of kind of Benko Gambit style concepts, but I'm pretty skeptical about its soundness. Obviously, we need to call the bluff because otherwise we allow this pawn to get to b4 or we allow black to take on c4. We might as well accept the sacrifice. We don't need to think about that. Black takes back. Okay. So again, there's no question that we're going to take the pawn on b5. Which piece should we capture it with? Well, I think that question has an obvious answer. Knight takes b5 seems very awkward to me. Not only because it opens up the diagonal for Black's bishop, but mostly because we take our eyes off of the d5 pawn. It's entirely possible that Black will ultimately win that pawn back, but we, we don't want to go down without a fight. And after knight takes b5, knight b6, suddenly we only have one defender on the pawn, and Black has three attackers. Maybe we could push the pawn to d6 in that position, 
and kind of make that work. But that just seems like it goes in the wrong direction. Bishop takes b5, a lot more natural, keeping the knight on its natural square. And of course, the bishop could later on dive into c6 and hit the rook and protect the pawn from a nice square. Now, typical in the Benko is to initiate the trade of light squared bishops with bishop a6. This is a move that you do see very frequently in the Benko. But in contrast to the Benko, which I'll show after the game. So if you're watching this on YouTube and you're, I don't know what the Benko gambit is, first of all, you can always pause the video and just Google it. Then you'll go down the rabbit hole and start watching Benko videos. It's a gambit that occurs after 1d4. And it, the mechanism is the, exactly the same. Black plays c5 and then b5. And it's fallen out of favor at the top level in recent years. White is considered to be sort of solidly better several different ways. But among club players, it's still a very dangerous weapon. It's absolutely still playable. And uh, the bottom line is that black develops in return for the pawn, long-lasting pressure on the queen side. But here it seems like we've already castled, which is a big uh, advantage for us. We've already brought our knights out. And black just doesn't have all that much stuff going on the queen side. The knight on d7 is passive. The pawn on c5 is weak. This seems like a seriously inferior Benko. But in general, not to belabor the point, our opponent is taking their, his time though. So when you hear players or commentators mention, oh, this is like a Benoni structure. This is a Benko-like idea. It's normally, it normally refers to some opening where the idea in question is more common than in the current opening. Like in the Sicilian, you rarely see this type of sacrifice. In the Benko, it literally revolves around that sacrifice. Bishop b7. Okay, so what does our opponent want? Well, probably he wants knight b6, after which the four pieces are going to be attacking the d5 pawn. If we lose that pawn, it's totally not the end of the world, but that might signal the end of our advantage. So what kinds of ideas come to mind here? Well... Let's take a couple of moments. I need to think. My temptation was the move bishop c6, right? This seemed very tempting to me because in the event of the trade, that pawn lands on c6 and could even move to c7 potentially with a fork. But after bishop c6, black has this weird looking move queen b6, which should be pretty obvious to you because it attacks the bishop two different ways. And in the event of the trade, that queen fianchettoed on b7 is actually a very strong piece. And in the Benko, black often wants the queen to be precisely there. Why? Because it pressures simultaneously both of white's weak pawns on d5 and b2. So we're ultimately helping black get their pieces where they want, want them to go. We should find an alternate way of meeting the threat of knight b6. And that's where the idea of bishop f4 comes in. Bishop f4 aims to meet knight b6 with d6. So this was my first candidate option. My second was very similar, bishop e3. Similar mechanism, tying black down to the c5 pawn. Bishop e3, if knight b6, then we capture the pawn on c5. And we have connected pass pawns on the queen side, which is a huge, huge asset that could be converted into victory in the event that the queens get traded. So bishop f4 and bishop e3 are my two big candidate moves. I like the look of bishop e3 because it's a little bit simpler. And I'll share some of my more detailed considerations after the game. I feel like bishop e3 might be a little bit more precise. Our opponent immediately opts for the line in question. Well, we have no choice but to take on c5. Maybe I rushed. Maybe bishop c6 here was possible. Uh, maybe bishop c6 was strong. Not entirely sure. Anyways, we'll explore that afterward. Knight takes d5. Okay. Okay. So now we need to navigate the complexities carefully, right? Because we've got a lot of pieces on black side of the board and they're undefended. And you just got to be careful not to blunder a fork or some, and you know, it's not the end of the world. Everything is pretty well positioned. So in general, right, from a large scale bird's eye view perspective, we want to trade pieces. We now have connected pass pawns. Any end game, be it a queen end game, rook end game is probably going to be winning for us. In the absence of a compelling reason not to, we should trade pieces, minor pieces, queens, whatever we can. And I don't see any reason that we shouldn't start by trading the ponies, by taking the knight on d5. Knight takes d5. And now I think we should essentially continue our campaign to trade as many minor pieces as possible and to do it as fast as possible. We have a, a nice way, I think, to pose a nasty little ultimatum to black, either you give up one of your main pieces, the bishop on g7, or 
you drop your knight back and your pieces become a lot more passive. What am I thinking about here? Yeah, I'm really eyeing the move bishop d4, and it seems very appetizing. Let's go for it. Yeah, obvious move. Threatening to trade the bishops. And then black will be saddled also with sort of weak king, which could become annoying if the queens remain on the board. I had to look at a move like knight to f4, right? Because the bishop on b7 is a pretty intimidating piece. And moves like knight f4 always need to be considered. But here, we actually take on g7 and we're able to force the queens off the board. And that resulting endgame is far from an obvious win. It might even be a draw. But I feel like with the extra pawn, we will, as long as we're able to keep Black's initiative at bay, the pawns should ultimately make their presence felt. Thank you for the sub, Kalia Shirts. But we'll think about it. We don't have to grab the queens automatically. We can also keep the queens on the board. It's not the end of the world. So, yeah, our opponent is thinking. Of course, knight f6 would avoid the trade of bishops, but that would be a positive for us because the knight would be brought away from the center and we could breathe a little bit more easily, rearrange our pieces, and ultimately start pushing our pawns, even if it's the middle game. Yeah, f6, f6 would be music to my ears, honestly. Maybe it's the best move. I don't know. Maybe f6 and e5. There's a case to be made for that, but it does seem incredibly weakening. E5, whoa, what a move. That one, I will admit, I didn't even, was not on my radar at all. So let's decipher the idea. Now, bishop takes e5 is the obvious recapture. I assume that black wants to take on e5, and after knight takes e5, bring the queen down to g5. Okay, that is what I assume to be black's idea. And rather than just immediately panicking and saying, oh, okay, let's trust our opponent, let's ponder that position for a second. After queen g5, the danger lies in the fact that black has pressure on g2 and black has an attack on the knight. But I think we have an ingenious tactical solution in that position. We can force that bishop off the board with the move bishop c6, right? So this is after takes, 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 queen g5. There, I think we have the move bishop c6. And if black takes the knight, then we take the bishop. If black takes the bishop, then we recapture with the knight. Black can threaten checkmate with knight f4, but it's just a one-move threat. And I think we can handily defend against it with, for example, queen f3. And then we will emerge two pawns up. Still, we won't be out of the woods. Black has some initiative, but it seems to me that Black's initiative will be dying out in that situation. We can also play knight takes e5, but that one I like a lot less because then Black can play the immediate knight f4 and our pieces just kind of get tangled up in the center. So we want to play a little faster here. We want to leave ourselves with some time. Let's play bishop e5 and call our opponent's bluff. Also possible, by the way, I just realized was bishop c5. I completely missed that move. But I actually like our choice because bishop c5, e4 would have been a complete and utter mess, even if we won the exchange. We'll explore that afterward. Okay, the other thing that I, you know, looked at a little bit is whether black has a fork on these two minor pieces. Because both of them are undefended, type 1 undefended pieces. But the queen has nowhere to attack both of them. Right? Queen e8 obviously blunders the queen. So that's the other thing that I made sure of. Other than queen g5, I don't see anything even remotely scary. Maybe knight f4, but obviously then we can take the queens off the board. And with two extra pawns, we should be fine. As long as we avoid g3, which runs into maiden 1, very common blunder, I think we'll be fine. So queen g5, bishop b5, 2c6. Hopefully everybody understands the logic behind that move. We attack the bishop on b7, and if the bishop takes, we recapture with the knight. And as a nice bonus, does anybody see what we're threatening in that resulting position? It's probably not going to matter because black will play knight f4 anyway. But if black, for example, plays rook a c8 there, then we have a sexy little tactic. Queen takes d5. Yeah, very nice. And then knight e7 check picks up the queen on d5. And I think perhaps our opponent has spotted bishop c6 and is now... Trying to figure out an alternate. Yeah. But it's just there's just not enough firepower on the board. We don't have any weaknesses. And it's important not to be scared of... So queen g5, bishop c6, trade. The move knight f4 there, I think, would be scary to a lot of players. And it should be scary, right? When a queen and a knight is attacking, that, by definition, is scary. The queen and the knight, the strongest tandem in chess. But a mate threat in and of itself 
isn't scary. We could just bring our queen up to f3. Black has no other attackers, whereas our rook is near the king. Our knight could easily jump back into the center, and we could push Black's knight away with a well-timed g3. Yeah, knight f4 here. I've been thinking about what we want to do if he plays knight f4. Because the queen trade, the funny thing there is that Black's initiative does last into the end game, for three reasons. First of all, the g2 pawn is hanging. Second of all, Black has the d file and the rook could infiltrate to d2. Third of all, remember, these minor pieces are both undefended. They're on the same rank, which means you should always be aware of a move like rook to d5. Which, incidentally, we might still have bishop c6 to the rescue, but we don't want to engage in these complications. So knight f4, I'm actually more inclined to play a different move, not to take the queen. What other moves are available to us after knight f4? Yeah, I think Tamo Bedlam got it. Nothing has to change just because the queens are staring at each other. We can still play the move that we were planning to play anyway. No, no, no. Don't play f3. Because then queen b6 picks up the bishop. Instead, after knight f4, I think we can just still play bishop c6. And we can still trade the bishops. If black wants to trade queens, be our guest, you know, and we get the d-file. So after knight f4, bishop c6, bishop takes c6, knight takes c6. If black plays queen g5 there, it simply transposes into the position that we've already been analyzing. Otherwise, the queen doesn't have any other great squares. Queen f6, we can go queen f3 there. What should black play, asks Kavita. I don't know. I think black is in big trouble. I think black has virtually no compensation for two pawns. I would probably go queen g5 and stick with the initial idea. Probably I would go queen g5, bishop c6, trade, go knight f4, and after queen f3, play a move like rook a e8 and basically just go all in and try to create something on the king side. But yeah, I think black is, unless I'm seriously misevaluating something or missing a concrete resource of some sort, some computerish idea, I think black is borderline lost. I do see a crazy idea that I'll reveal after the game, unless our opponent plays this move. And queen f6. And that was the move. That was the move uh, that I had in mind. So the idea is you're luring white into knight d7, which appears to win the exchange. What is black's idea after knight d7? Well, then black plays queen g5. Notice that bishop c6 is no longer possible, but you might think, I, don't, I just take the rook. But if you take the rook, white's knight jumps out to e3, with a double attack, right? This is a discovery against g2, and white's queen is under fire. There, I think white just collapses and loses the queen. So after knight d7, queen g5, that position seems very tactical, and I'm not sure that it's worth going for it, especially with a low time situation, unless we find something specific after knight d7, queen g5. So I'm going to take a couple moments here and think about this, because this is a high stakes position have an idea. I'm just double checking it. D7, queen g5. I'm eyeing the move queen to f3, which is a very risky move because we're putting the queen right under the bishop's nose. But I don't see any effective discoveries there. And I think everything might be under control. There, there, there. Let's say black moves the rook. And we can jump back to c5 with the knight and hit the bishop where it hurts. Yeah, I think... We will go precisely for this idea. Let's go knight d7. Let's go knight d7. And now we're just quickly going to play this move. Not knight takes rook because of knight e3. But instead, we bring our queen to the rescue. This might be a blunder. You know, I might be blundering something. So the key concept here is why would a move like this not occur to a lot of players? Well, because you're putting the queen where you're not supposed to put it. But remember that pins are often two-way streets. This is what people might not understand. Yes, the more valuable piece is usually the more vulnerable piece because the stakes are less for black. But still, the bishop on b7 is just as undefended as the queen is. So this is dangerous for the queen, but it's also dangerous for the bishop. The knight can't really move because the bishop is undefended. That concept is important. It allows you to understand the value of a move like queen f3. Is it risky? Yes. Could it be very rewarding? Also, yes. Also, queen g3 is a safe move that we could play virtually regardless of black's response, but we could also go for more depending on where the rook moves. I'm assuming that black will move his rook. Yeah, but rook a7 
is a very ingenious move to defend the bishop, but there I think we can probably take the rook on f8. I think rook a7 we already can take. Because if white black plays knight e3 there, how should we respond in that position? Who can uh, keep their composure? Knight, rook a7, knight takes f8, and knight e3, we ignore the knight because then we get checkmated. Where do we move our queen? Yeah, we just play queen g3 there because we're already up a rook. So all we need to do is defend against the immediate threat. Yeah, Harold Lloyd brings up a, a great point, great tactical eye. If black plays rook c8, there is rook a to d1 with the threat of a double capture on d5 with knight f6 check to follow. But I feel like that's a little bit of one move itis. Black can defend against that, and I don't know if we want to burn our tempo on that threat. I do think rook fc8 is black's best move. In fact, I'm pretty confident because it prevents knight c5. So I think black should play rook fc8. But then we've got time, right? Rook fc8, black does not have any threats, so we can make a general improving move potentially, such as even a move like rook fe1 could be considered. Rook fc8 played. All right, let's think. Give me 30 seconds. So I've, I've had a couple candidate moves here. And they all stem from the same general sentiment, which is that white is not in a hurry. I don't see any threats for black, surprisingly enough. So we have the time and the luxury to make an improving move. And what does it mean to make an improving move here? Well, we have the move queen g3, which tries to get the queens off the board. I like the move queen g3. I think it might be the most practical option. But we don't have to rush with queen g3. We can play that move next. So... A move that I also like is rook f to e1, bringing the rook to an open file, getting the rook into the game. The problem there might be the move rook to c2. So that's what I'm struggling with right now. I'm calculating a crazy line. Rook f e1, rook c2, rook e5, trying to give the rook up for two pieces. Rook c1 check, bishop f1. Oh my gosh, it gets pretty crazy there. I don't really want that. Rook a d1, actually. <laughs> the more I look at it, the more I like it. Okay. I have another idea. A4 is also very interesting, just pushing the pawn. Let's go A4, which is the most anticlimactic move ever. It took three minutes for me to generate this move. And I'll explain stuff in a lot greater detail after the game. I'll sort of walk you through all my calculations. But right now, I don't want to lose on time. The TLDR is that I want this bishop to be defended because... If the knight moves away, I don't want to deal with the queen's attack on the bishop. I want to be able to focus on the king side. Also, this bishop is crucial because it defends the knight. And the knight is kind of stuck in black's territory. So the last thing we would want is to lose the bishop because then we might lose the knight. So this allows me to focus on the king side and on improving my position. Now, we might even sacrifice the b2 pawn. Okay, black finds this move. Now, there's knight b6 here, which is interesting. But I had my eyes on queen g3. Now we're going to try to trade. Now, black doesn't have to opt for the trade. But if he doesn't, then that means the attack is over. And then we can finally focus on bringing our pieces into the game. There is a very subtle tactical line that I spent like two minutes calculating, which occurs if black takes the queen and then takes the pawn on b2, which I'm assuming our opponent will. And maybe it doesn't work. I mean, it's, it's, it's very tenuous. And he does. And we will. And we drop our knight back. That was, the, that was the move that I spent so long searching for. But I actually am seeing a way for black to dodge the loss of material. We're almost winning. Wow, there's a crazy idea for black here that I did overlook. Now, we'll still have winning chances here no matter what, obviously. Because we're up a pawn. Now, I thought this won the game because the bishop is attacked. And if black defends it... Well, then we take it and play bishop c6, forking the rook and the knight on d5. But I won't say this until black moves and black finds it. So bishop c6, I missed rook a5, counterattacking the knight. Okay, let's not panic. Let's, let's figure out a way to keep the pressure going. There must be something here. I just don't have time to figure it out. Some sort of Magnus would find a very strong move here in an instant. I like the look of even rook fc1, very simple move. Yeah, just rook fc1 looks very, very strong here, too. Let's play it. Just improving the position. And obviously, we now reinforce the threat of bishop c6 because the knight is protected. 
Also, we're keeping an eye on rook takes b5. It's very important that the rooks defend each other. Let's not move a rook off of the first rank. Then, okay, bishop f5. That might have been a blunder. Because let's consider bishop c6. I'm assuming that our opponent wants rook d8. But does anybody see what move we have in that position? That might finally topple black's resistance. Bishop c6, rook d8. The rook and the queen. They're not particularly good defenders because they're easy pieces to attack. We have knight c5 to b7. The bishop and the knight are the heroes of this game. They're constantly rearranging to form new threats. This is, I think, the move Black finally overlooks. And this might do it. This might do it. Only 28 moves. It's crazy how short this game has been and how much has happened. I think this ends it. Black is out of squares. Okay, and our opponent is desperation. Now, let's be precise. Don't grab the knight. You know, it's like you're grabbing the first can type of candy that you see. Try to be accurate. It's much more accurate to take the rook here. And after rook takes b7 to return to c6 and pick off the knight, then we'll be up a rook and the game ends. Very nice. GG. I, I have to come. Our opponent played a fantastic game. This was, this was close. And there's a lot to analyze. So let's try to do it as carefully as we can. So first order of business is for us to educate ourselves on this line. And I am going to grab our Alapin Bible. Now note that the second reliable source on the Alapin is the new Chessable course that came out by Genguli and uh, Kasim Janov that you can find on Chessable. I could check that one as well, but we will limit ourselves to the book. Squeezing the Sicilian by Alexander Kalifman. Yeah, knight f6, queen a4. I was, my hunch was correct. Yeah, the queen a4 check. This is the move that is recommended by Kalifman. Black might have unnecessary difficulties to regain his pawn on d5. Bishop d7 is the only move that they... No, that is not the only move they give. There's bishop d7 and there's knight bd7. Obviously, <laughs> queen d7 does not deserve any analysis. If bishop d7... Then the, the queen is dropped back to b3. This is a nice square. Queen b6 is virtually forced. Otherwise, black is not going to be able to even try to regain the pawn. They also give queen c7, just bishop c4. So you actually load the pieces up on this pawn. And it's not just the extra pawn that's the problem. Black can't move. Like this pawn is restricting black's development in a big way. This is plus minus. Queen e5 check, simply knight e2. And black is already losing. His d4 is coming next. So queen b6 here is the main line. And now you keep the tension with bishop c4. They give knight a6, the only way to develop. Now we develop as well. And black brings the knight around to c7. Very typical maneuver in this line. And here, they give the move d4. So the general concept here is similar. You wait for the appropriate moment to open up the center. And when you open up the center, you are giving the pawn back. But as a consequence, you're going to get a big initiative in the middle game or in the end game in this case. Queen takes b3. A takes b3. Black is able to win the pawn back. Cd, knight d4. They also uh, mention the move d6, giving the pawn away but ruining black's pawn structure. It's an interesting alternative. But in their main line, we get this end game. And white is slightly better, no question about it. Because white's pieces are very nicely placed. Black is cramped. White's got, you know, obvious control of the A-file and a very mobile pawn mass on the queen side. This is the game Hammer Kulov against Guerrero, Spain 2008. So, for example, if black plays E6 here, I think a good way to follow up would be to get this knight around. Not to d2, that's not the destination, right? This is a Frankfurt Airport move. Where is the knight going? It's going to f3 to support its brother and potentially also jump into e5. White could also contribute to the pressure with b4. So definitely uh, a very practical line there. And if black plays knight bd7, which I think is more popular, then they give the rare move queen b3, again, defending the pawn. And this is easy to remember because you play queen b3, against both bishop d7 and knight d7. If black plays knight to b6, then we deliver the check now with a bishop. Bishop d7 and c4. Black plays e6, but now e6 no longer comes 
with the same effect because after DE, Black has to recapture with the pawn, and that is incredibly awkward. If Black has to recapture with a pawn, then there's no more compensation. Bishop d6, this is some game that they're giving. Brunovic, Janzel, 2018, so pretty recent game. Takes, takes, queen e3, queen e7, d3. Castles, queen e2, and they give plus minus. Yeah, Black has virtually no compensation because he himself has a backward pawn on e6. Finally, if Black plays move 5, g6, trying to just fee and keto, then we develop our pieces modestly with bishop e2. Avoid bishop c4 because that walks right into knight b6. Castles, castles. If knight b6 again, it's time for c4. And if b6, then d3, bishop b7. Again, we play c4. And again, if black plays e6, then he has to recapture it with the pawn. And here they claim after knight g4, black's pieces are very active and white's defense is not easy at all. Um, ooh. So I apologize. This line apparently equalizes for black. So their improvement on move nine is the immediate c4. White should not lose a tempo for the move d3, but try instead to advance d4 at once. Bishop b7, knight c3, e6, trade. Oh, and rather than playing d3, you open up the center immediately with d4. And here they claim that white is a slight advantage. Takes, takes, knight c5, queen d1. Everything is nicely defended. Knight f e4, bishop e3, trade. And they claim a slight advantage for white. White is up a pawn. And the central piece mass is very, very compact here. So definitely something that I would investigate further. But for all intents and purposes, this is absolutely a line that you could play and expect to get an advantage in. So rather than our move, which was bishop b5 check, similar idea, but you do it with the queen, queen a4 check. And uh, against both responses, the queen moves back to b3. If bishop d7, queen b3 attacks the pawn, I think bishop d7 is just a bad move. And here, you defend the pawn, but at some point, you take the plunge and you open up the center, getting a better endgame. And if black plays knight bd7, then you still play queen b3. And here, you do try to keep your extra pawn. If knight b6, then you throw in this other check and then follow up with c4 in order so that after e6, de, black cannot recapture with the bishop. All right, I think, and, and g6 might be black's best move, but not a lot of people are going to know this. And now, you develop, develop, and then at some point, you protect the pawn with c4 in order also to get the c3 square for the knight. And then you try to go d4 in one fell swoop. So hopefully that was relatively clear that this is Caliphon's recommendation against knight f6. And definitely we can continue playing this with black. I mean, very few people are going to know this, especially know this by heart. My bishop b5 check is obviously a totally viable alternative. It might even be what they recommend in the chessable course. I don't know. Uh, I'll check this after the stream. Black plays bishop uh, knight bd7, which is correct. And now we open up the center with d4. a6 is definitely the only correct move for black. So once again, if black had played knight d5, this is hasty because here white simply emerges up a pawn. And after e6, I think we can drive this pawn down to c6 and make things even worse for black. Black has to trade... And in this position, I would not grab a second pawn because that walks right into bishop b7 with a huge initiative. Instead, I would just develop my pieces with knight f3, also because this could threaten knight e5. Here, definitely, black has insufficient compensation, no question about it. After a6, we bring our bishop back. Black recaptures on d5. And now I like our decision to play c4 and d5. I think this is extremely testing. And I actually think that Black's main mistake came here. I think g6, as natural as it is, might be a serious inaccuracy, after which Black is struggling quite a bit to equalize. And I don't think equality is possible after this move. Instead, what should Black consider doing immediately? This is actually what happened in my game, or in the uh, Rapid Chess Championship, the one time I played. Yeah, Black actually should go b5 immediately. Not e6. This is a terrible structure for black. Here, white is definitely better. But black should go for the Benko-style idea immediately with b5. And after cb5, black goes knight b6. And the chief difference is that black is able to win back the pawn on d5. 
If we compare this to the situation where our opponent played b5, which was here, what is the difference? Well, still, black should have played knight b6. Still, black should have played knight b6. And here, I also think that black is able to win back the pawn. So the interesting thing is that if we follow the course of the game, and I did just check this with the engine, I mentioned this during the game, but it might have been worth spending a tempo, maybe after knight c3, to play the move a4 and prevent black from playing b5. I really think this was worth a tempo. Somehow I forgot that knight b6 wins back the pawn. But the most clinical continuation for black is to not procrastinate and immediately play b5 and knight b6. And if white plays b takes a6, I think the simplest is just to recapture the pawn because this pawn is not going anywhere. And after the trade, black is going to win back the pawn on d5. And I think black is very close to equalizing here. The engine gives the move queen e2, hitting the rook. And if the rook moves away, then there is a very nasty check on b5. So black has to be very careful here. And apparently the move for black is c4, intercepting the queen. Knight c3, knight f takes d5, trade on d5, knight f3. Now both sides develop, e6, castles, bishop e7. And this position is approximately equal. White has a nice passed pawn, but black has very active pieces. The engine gives zeros. So this is indeed the equalizing line, but it's hard. I mean, you got to you got to know to play b5 and you got to know to play knight b6, so it takes quite a few accurate moves to equalize here. So definitely you could repeat this in one of your games and you can expect to get a good position. Okay. So in the game, our opponent decided to first develop the king side, which I think is fine. Once again, perhaps a4 was a little bit more precise from our perspective to prevent b5. Because after b5, c takes b5, definitely a takes b5 is a very serious mistake. It's an automatic move, right? It's very natural to recapture, but that allows our bishop to jump into a very active square. And now black is too late to go knight b6, because here we have bishop c6 protecting the pawn. This is the chief difference. If black plays knight b6 immediately, then we're unable to defend this pawn with our bishop. And again, if we play ba, then black can either take on a6, or in this case, I think black can take on d5 first. And white could end up being worse in a position like this, because black's pieces are much more active. This is like a dream Benko setup. Engine gives queen c2, and black just recaptures. And in this position, apparently white is worse. Just because look at the activity that black has reached. I mean, white can barely move a muscle. The bishop is tied down to the pawn. The other pawn is hanging. The rook's coming in. This is what you're trying to avoid on the white side of a Benko structure, even though you are technically up a pawn. So knight b6 did equalize here. Apparently white should play bishop to e3, counterattacking the c5 pawn. And now you get some sort of mass liquidation. Takes, 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 takes. And if you play rook b1, then black simply drops the bishop back with some sort of equal position. Bishop c4 is the engine move, counterattacking the knight. Yeah, things get very complicated here, but black is not worse. Black is not worse. So the key for our opponent would have been to go knight b6 immediately. That, that just shows you the level of subtlety that accompanies lines at this level. So, But hopefully everybody understood the logic. Okay, so our opponent decided to take on b5 first, and that is what gave us the big advantage. Bishop b7. Now I decided on the move bishop b3. And perhaps my other candidate move would have been a little bit more to the point, which was bishop f4, with the idea of meeting knight b6 with d6. This also, now that I look at this after the game, this seems very, very appealing to white. And I think white is clearly better here as well. Obviously, if black takes, then we take back with the bishop. And at the end, the rook on f8 is going to be trapped. This is not acceptable. So I think bishop f4 is, is, is perhaps even more precise. But bishop b3 looks pretty good as well. Okay, knight b6 made sense. Just to reiterate why bishop c6 is a bad move, here black can play queen b6. As I pointed out during the game, the last thing that we want is to help black's queen get to this ideal square. And ultimately, we probably will end up losing the d5 pawn here. So don't be hasty. Develop your pieces, bishop b3 and knight b6. This really transitions the game from, I think, the positional phase to the tactical phase. Bishop takes c5. We take the second pawn. Black picks up d5. We trade. And we play bishop d4. 
And in retrospect, I do think that e5 is probably a mistake. It's an incredibly creative move. And kudos to our opponent for finding it. But probably white's advantage could have been minimized if black had played knight f4, which is what I think black should have done. Now, my plan here was to trade on g7 and actually to avoid taking on d8, right? Because if you take on d8 here, black gets the rook to an open file. Black even has the possibility of trading on f3 and infiltrating the second rank. So I think keeping the tension here with a move like a4 would give white a big advantage. This is what I would have done, a move like a4. And I think white is clearly better, but the game continues. Black is quite active. But I know that this is pretty technical, so let's really get to the fun part of the game. Let's discuss the position after queen g5. So takes, takes, takes. And first and foremost, the move queen g5 had to be examined. Bishop c6 is a critical resource. I think without this resource, black's initiative would have been successful. Maybe we also have knight f3, but bishop c6 is definitely the best move. I just checked with the engine. It wins the game. Black, black's initiative evaporates. Again, queen e5, bishop b7. We can also trade the bishop for the knight. And in the event of the trade, black has no more attack. Knight f4, simply queen f3. That's it. There's no way to even create a threat against white's king. If black plays rook a8, the engine actually says you can start pushing. There is no attack to speak of. Knight e2 check is just one check. It doesn't do anything. You cannot dislodge the queen from f3. A rook e3 would be awesome, but there's a pawn on f2 that's protecting that square. So just because it's the middle game, and this is another common misconception, doesn't mean that past pawns can't be promoted with the queens on the board. They absolutely can be, right? So the plan here for white is a4, b4, or just push the a pawn all the way down to a7 because that's a protected square. So in any case, queen f6 is a lovely idea by our opponent, inducing knight d7 and now bringing the queen to g5. And here it was crucial for us to find queen f3. So once again, why not knight takes f8? Apart from knight e3, even more decisive is knight f4. This is literally checkmate in three moves because g2 is under fire and white has no way to defend it. And if g3, then knight h3 is made. White has to stave it off by playing bishop c6 and then queen f3. <laughs> that tells you all you need to know. So queen f3 is, I think, a very instructive move. And as I mentioned during the game, the way you find these types of moves is you realize that a pin or an x-ray is a two-way street, particularly if the piece that's quote-unquote giving the x-ray, the piece of lower value, is also undefended. The queen can be just as much of an aggressor as the bishop can. And it's important that black can't bring the rook to b8. That square is protected by the knight. So the bishop will remain undefended on the next move. So black plays rook fc8, which I think is, is virtually forced. And Harold Lloyd asks, can you analyze rook fd1 instead of a4? So I, I'm proud of a4. I think this is a very calm move, which just improves the position because black has no threat. Harold suggested rook f to d1, which I also really like. I actually think this is a great move. And black has a hard time stopping this brilliant threat of the double capture on d5. Even if black plays rook c2, you can still take on d5, I think. Bishop d5, queen d5, queen d5, knight f6. And in the resulting endgame, white should definitely be winning here, especially because black is unable, I think, to win the a2 pawn. Otherwise, that should be a draw. If rook a4... Who can tell me how white keeps everything alive? What is, and I just checked with the engine, this is a very important resource for white. Otherwise, the a2 pawn is lost. Don't go bishop b3 and blunder to rook takes b3. So that's what it's not. Knight e3, only move. Retreating knight moves. Knight defends the bishop. Bishop defends the pawn. And the knight is on a defended square. Also, don't go rook c1 because of the back rank trick with rook takes c4. So... Your move, Harold, would be fantastic as well. Rook fd1. I was, like, irrationally worried about black bringing the king up to g7. And I was also reticent about going for this position because I thought maybe I'm miscalculating something. Maybe there's some back rank check. I wasn't totally sure. And I thought that a4 was a safer option in time pressure because this basically guarantees that everything is protected. And, you know, moves like a4 are hard to find especially when there's a lot going on, there's a lot of traffic in the position, finding a quiet move that improves your position is hard from 
a psychological standpoint as well, because you feel like you need to do something. The way that you find these types of moves is that you first and foremost need to figure out whether there is an actual threat, right? That's the first thing I asked myself. Does black have a threat? The answer is no, because there's no discovery. We take the bishop in all of the cases. Notice that if black plays knight e3, we don't take the knight. We still take the bishop. And here we can, we can take on f1, but even better is to take the rook on f8. So there is literally nothing that black can do to us. I wanted to play knight b6. This is a really creative idea, but it fails because after knight b6, queen b7, guess what? The bishop on b5 is hanging. That's actually how I found the move a4. And I thought, wait a second, if we play a4 to support the bishop, not only does that you know, relieve our burden on the queen side, it makes this knight b6 idea possible against a lot of options. Like if black makes a random move, knight b6 is an excellent move because it forks the rooks and it forces black to give up his only active piece, and here white is simply winning. So that was part of the reason that I played a4, big part of the reason. And of course, the fact that it pushes the pass pawn, which is good in and of itself. Now, hopefully the reasoning makes sense. I had other candidate moves here. I was seriously contemplating, as you guys know, rook fe1. And the reason I rejected it is because of rook c2. And at this point, black has some crazy tactical ideas. Here, I got scared because at first I thought we could still play knight b6, but no, takes, and again, the bishop hangs. That's not still not possible. And if you play a move like a4, black can already make a draw or come very close to making a draw. Who can spot the tactic that black now has, which becomes a lot stronger with the rook now sitting on c2? What can black now do that previously led nowhere? Very nice. Dark Tiger got it. Knight f4 is correct. Now, what's the chief difference? The difference is that here, white no longer has the move king f1 because rook takes f2 is checkmate. Compare that to this position. Here, king f1 is not only winning, but it's the only move. And f2 is protected. But with the rook on c2, king f1 is not possible. Black, white has to go king h1, and black is able to repeat moves. And it's a miracle that black isn't mating white. This is a draw. And this is the concept that just because an idea doesn't work in one position doesn't mean that it doesn't work in another. You have to constantly update your perception of the board. Any, anytime any piece moves to a more active square, you need to reassess and reevaluate a lot of the key tactical ideas, which you know are, you know, need to be carefully calculated. Knight f4 is an obvious move, so you have to keep considering it because things might have changed imperceptibly with the rook, let's say, coming to c2. And again, I definitely have some examples of this type of thinking leading to a blunder, not thinking in this way. But I'd have to think about it, and I think we've done enough. So every move, yeah, you have to update the board state, but you can only do it so much, especially in a blitz game, right? You can't spend five minutes reassessing and recalculating but it's a lot easier at times to do that than it seems here it's quite easy because you know exactly what the rook is doing and if you pay attention to the right factors you'll understand that knight f4 a much more powerful threat this time once we finish the game i'll see if i can come up with some examples okay so a4 was played our opponent plays rook c2 and now i went for the practical option of queen g3 now, turning on the engine yields some crazy stuff. According to the engine, we should have stuck with the rook ad1 idea. And after rook takes b2, you guys know the drill. Rook takes d5 is the simplest. And you don't even need queen takes d5. You can actually just deliver the check immediately. And the queens on the board favor white because black's king is in huge trouble. So rook ad1, for some reason, did not occur to me because I was very worried about knight f4. Oh... But of course, now, now the king can go to h1, and after knight takes f2, you can take it. And that is why you bring put the a rook on d1 and not the f rook, right? That's the difference. Here, knight f4 makes a draw. This is like what it comes down to when you got these tactical games, these small, subtle differences. But all of it can be understood, right? It's, it's logical. It's just hard to see during the game. Um, but also, intuitively, I would play rook ad1 because I wouldn't move pieces away from the king with all of black's pieces trained at the king. Um, and after rook ad1, if black plays king g7, our old friend makes an appearance, knight b6 again. And again, the genius of the a4 now shines through because we never have to worry about the hanging bishop. This is why undefended pieces 
are so freaking, uh, you know, potentially fatal. And, wh and conversely, why keeping your pieces defended by pawns often allows you to benefit in these tactical sequences. So we played queen g3. I think our opponent had to trade. I don't think there was an alternative. And what I overlooked is, of course, that after bishop c8, bishop c6, I overlooked the move rook a5. Otherwise, black loses at least in exchange. Here, black counterattacks the knight, and if the knight drops back, then the rook defends the other knight. So it's important that black has this move because there's no alternative. The bishop is trapped, and if black had played rook a7, then we take the bishop and fork the rook and the knight with bishop c6. This I saw. This I saw. Great job by our opponent, spotting the tactical detail. And now, I think I did something that I'm pretty proud of because we had only a minute 30. I think a lot of players in general, when you're banking on something, you've calculated a sequence, and then suddenly you realize that you had overlooked something, right? It's very important not to just sort of stubbornly play the move anyway. I think a lot of players, you might relate to this. I've done this before, where you almost don't want to believe that the move doesn't work. And so you dig yourself into the hole because you're too lazy to look for other options. But it's important to admit to yourself as quickly as possible, yes, I overlooked this move. Yes, this actually makes things worse for white because if the knight has to drop back, then black's rooks now get active and white's advantage virtually evaporates. So you have to double back, put a stop to it, and, and say, okay, I'm not playing bishop c6. How can I improve my position? And once you phrase it like that, I think it's obvious that the rook from f1 needs to get into the game. Rook fc1 is a very natural move. Rook fd1, I think, would have also been a very good move. I was worried about knight c3, but apparently this position is good for white. I just checked the engine, and the pin against the bishop is very strong. But this is kind of hard to evaluate. And I thought rook fc1 is a harder move to face practically because it restricts the knight. It defends the c3 square. And black could have maintained drawing chances here with the move knight before. The engine gives about plus two. It's still definitely a winning endgame. We would have traded the other rook. And I don't think this is defensible from a human standpoint. Also because the knight has to go back to a6. Now, of course, there is bishop c6 and knight b3. Very similar to what we did in the game. Our opponent hastened his defeat with bishop f5. Now, again, just because the move doesn't work in one position doesn't mean you have to stop checking it. That's why we played rook fc1 to protect the knight taking the sting out of rook a5. And luckily, we have this move, knight b7, dislodging the rook from d8. Dislodging the, the rook from d8. Okay, and that ends the game because, okay, the best that black can do is to give up the exchange, but without the a pawn, there would be technique required. With the a pawn, this is elementary win. Elementary win. Okay, so I wish I had some ready-made examples of some of the, the principles that we outlined. But still, we've done a lot of analysis in this game. So I think that will be sufficient. Any questions? Because there, there's a lot, a lot that we talked about. We covered the theory, which is queen a4 check. We examined sort of typical Benko-like ideas that black has to carry out in order to equalize. Just for the sake of completeness, the Benko gambit, which I should have showed earlier, is d4, knight f64, c5. This is the entry point to the Benoni. e6 is the modern Benoni, where black Fianchetto is the bishop. The Benko is b5, also called the Volga gambit in Russia. b5. So you sacrifice the pawn, and then typically you play the move a6. And here you can see the similarity in the structure in the sense that black has the open a and b files that he will try to use to put pressure on white's queen side. And usually... The dark squared bishop is fianchettoed here. And that's about it. White does not have to play ba, by the way. In the banco, white often sacks the pawn back with a move like b6 to keep the queen side closed. So the banco is uh, an incredibly complex opening in its own right. But black had to demonstrate those ideas in order to equalize ASAP. So our opponent didn't play b5. We could have prevented it with a4 on several different occasions. And here, the big mistake was to play the automatic move which helps our bishop get active. Knight b6 seems to equalize for black. Then later, um, fast forwarding to the next important moment, we kind of initiate a series of trades. So kind of knowing what you want to accomplish is important and not buying your opponent's bluff, right? Bishop e5, queen g5 looks very scary. 
but you calculate one move further and then you find bishop c6 and once again here as well it seems like the move knight d7 fails but you don't have to assume that knight takes f8 is forced you have to look for other moves queen f3 comes to the rescue and the rest was pretty smooth we're getting some questions about a couple different opening lines remember that there will be dedicated YouTube videos on all of the Alpin lines. Okay, so that's separate from the speed run, I will cover the theory in a series of videos, including the move E5, which we have not faced, but is a recommendation of some YouTubers. Definitely need to know how to respond. White can get an advantage here, so it's, it's not the end of the world, but uh, you can wait for those, and hopefully we'll face more theoretically testing Alpin lines during the speed run. And uh, have a great start to your weekend, everybody. Thanks for hanging out.